Warning, the polysyllabic profanity in this episode has monosyllabic profanity wedged into it. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by Stamps.com and by the protective PPE for the Trump supporter on the go. The N95 KKK mask, complete with protective hood. The N95 KKK mask. Now will you wear it? And now, The Scathing Atheist. Hi, I'm Lisa Ann, co-host of the new podcast, The Bardcast. It's Shakespeare, you dick. And this is Don, vet tech and training specialist at the same university that developed the polio vaccine. And as someone who has studied the work of one of history's preeminent primates, William Shakespeare, a suspected scathing atheist. And as someone who works for years at a time getting to know individual non-human primates. We, we can, can assure, assure you that, that we, we did, did, in fact, evolve, evolve from, from filthy, filthy monkey, monkey men and women. It's July 9th, and it's Be Nice to Jersey Week. Uh, I like your industrial waste. It's nice <laughs> you. <laughs> I'm no illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And from Aaron Burrs, New Jersey, Cincinnati Swing State, and Good Husband, Georgia, this is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, the government takes a PPP all over the First Amendment. If your rat has an erection that lasts more than four hours, it wasn't homeopathy, it was you. <laughs> and Tom and Cecil from Cognitive Dissonance will be here to act as insult loop. But first, the diatribe. I honestly didn't think my when I was your age stories would be about the rights we used to have. But, you know, I was naively optimistic enough to think that this country couldn't possibly elect Donald Trump its president all the way up until election night. So what the fuck do I know? You know, look, Trump is not going to have much of a legacy. As unbreakable as his hold on the Republican Party seems now, it'll disintegrate the instant he's out of power. They'll start trying to sanitize him from the party's memory that second, if not before. The overwhelming majority of his reforms are going to be rescinded. Virtually all of his executive orders are going to be nullified. His pathetic little wall will be torn down and thrown into the Rio Grande if it hasn't managed to fall in there of its own accord before we can get to it. You know, we're going to rejoin the WHO. We'll re-sign the Paris Climate Accord. We'll salvage the Iran nuclear deal if we can. That kind of shit can more or less be repaired. But if the courts ever recover, I will not live to see it. Odds are you won't either. You will never again live in an America with as much freedom as it had when you were born. And if you're one of our non-U.S. listeners, you can take some comfort in that. But you'll never live in a world with as much freedom. So it's not like the blankets all the way dry for you either. John Roberts and his court of theocratic partisans have been given way too much credit for the few bones they've thrown to minorities. Right. Like, I don't get me wrong. I, I don't want to minimize the truly historic gains the LGBTQ community has won under the Roberts court. But the court doesn't deserve a hell of a lot of credit. You know, the activists that spent the last several decades educating the rest of us put the court in a position where it almost couldn't help but affirm those hard earned rights. I mean, consider the recent decision that infuriated so many Christians about LGBTQ employment rights. Like th this decision makes it illegal for employers to fire somebody for being gay or trans. And that's awesome. Right. That is a long overdue right. But it's also a right that already existed for most Americans. Even before that decision, most people lived in states that protected gay people from employment discrimination. And the overwhelming majority of national chains and national brands had at least policies in place against it and for nothing but PR purposes. So, yes, it still matters that the SCOTUS affirms it and that the rest of the country gets it. It is still historic, but it was also culturally inevitable. And it was inevitable because of the work of activism and education. Right. Like I'd have ventured to say that most Americans probably thought it already was illegal to fire somebody for being gay. And, and let's not lose sight of the fact that even in that decision, Gorsuch planted a poison pill that all but guaranteed exemptions for religious employers. At the same time, they were affirming that right. They were undermining it. Hell, one might even say that that was the chief effect of this decision. 
right? But even if I'm being overly critical here and they deserve a goddamn parade for that one, it is still overshadowed by virtually every other decision they've made since Gorsuch joined the fucking court. The relentless effort to expand the definition of religious freedom to include things like denying the freedom of others has been and will remain the chief contribution of Robert's court to American law. This ridiculous hyperinflation that has made second class citizens out of not only non-Christians, but any minority that Christians deign to disfavor is what this court has given us or rather what it has taken away from us. Right. The most recent middle finger to secular government was an expansion of the ministerial exception. That's the legal doctrine first codified by John Roberts Court in 2012 in a decision he wrote the majority opinion on that exempts churches from anti-discrimination laws when they hire ministers. It's why, for example, a woman can't sue the Catholic Church for refusing to hire her for a priest position just because she's a woman. But when they conjured up this bullshit exemption, they declined to actually define minister. Right. Clarence Thomas's dumbass argued that the court should, quote, defer to a religious organization's good faith understanding, end quote. Of course, like every other group ever trusted by the government to police itself, churches did not apply a rigid definition here and ultimately expanded out the definition of minister to any position they cared to discriminate in. Right. And I'd love to use that as evidence, by the way, that the SCOTUS fucked this all up in the first place. But this week they were faced with that fact, you know, the churches had obviously used this exception for positions that no reasonable person could define as minister. And they doubled right the fuck down on it. According to Alito, it's up to churches to, quote, decide for themselves, free from state interference, matters of church government, as well as those of faith and doctrine, end quote. In other words, and this is not remotely hyperbolic. Employment laws should not apply to religious institutions. That's what the fucking words he wrote meant. And if you think, by the way, that this is somehow going to be limited to churches, I should point out that the cases before the court that prompted this decision were not from fucking churches. They were from religious schools. And as we've learned over the last few years, a goddamn theme park can be a ministry if it means they don't have to hire gay people. It's time we stop talking about repairing the wall of separation, right? At this point, we're paying the salaries of clergy out of the public coffers. There's a separate set of fucking laws for religious and non-religious people. There is no wall left to repair. If there ever is one again, it's going to be because we built a new one from scratch. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the rock and scissors to my paper, Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick. Fellas, are you ready to shoot? Look, paper covers rock is bullshit. Rock is fine. If anything, rock is now stronger <laughs> because it's wearing paper. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. Rock's like a paperweight. That's like a thing. Rock covers paper as a thing. That's no, weird. Okay, well, now I need a second to recover from you guys minimizing what I bring to the Rochambeau. I hope system gets fucked up if paper doesn't <laughs> defeat rock. And while I recover... We'll offer up a word from this week's sponsor, Stamps.com. Okay, and now the stamp goes on the corner of the envelope. Which one, though? T top right. Top My right. right or yours? I'm going to look like an idiot. I'm going to look. Dude, dude, relax. Hey, hey, I uh, heard a bunch of screaming. What's, what's going on? Are you trying to bathe Eli again? No, Eli and I are just working on his post office skills again. His post office skills? Yeah, you know, uh, fixing stamps, swim packages. It can all be a little much for him. Last time I just walked in, yelled, send this to Jerry and spiked my package on the floor. Yes, you okay. did. Okay, yeah, that tracks. Uh, why don't you just use stamps.com? What's stamps.com? You said that kind of weird. Yeah, just say the products normally. Noah, this I, is a paid ad. This is our job. I, I hate Serious. you guys. With stamps.com, you can print postage on demand and skip those lines and crowds at the post office. Plus... You can actually save some money with discounts you can't even get at the post office. And as if that wasn't enough, Stamps.com, they also offer UPS services with discounts up to 62% and no UPS residential surcharges. Wow, that is good. Yep, and right now, our listeners get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale without any long-term commitment. Just go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in scathing. That's stamps.com. Enter scathing. Stamps.com. Stay safe, my friends. Stay safe printing postage from home. 
No, no, no. It looks like Eli's reeling back to bite you again. Just heads up. right? Dude, right cut now. it out. Stop. Tell me what a zip code is. I already did. <laughs> <laughs> and now back to the headlines. In our lead story tonight, after much hemming and hawing about the downsides of financial accountability in government, the Trump administration reluctantly agreed to release a partial accounting of whatever happened to those billions upon billions of dollars entrusted to them under the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Securities Act. And it confirmed every terrible thing we assumed about the administration's stewardship of our money, including the fact that they didn't give two shits if you found out how crooked their stewardship of our money has been. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but to be fair, unless you're Dr. Evil, you're going to be way off on the numbers. Let yeah, right. right now. <laughs> this is terrifying. Republicans actually argued that oversight of the giant relief fund to make sure the money gets distributed responsibly would be an irresponsible waste yes, of government right, money. Right. That's an argument they yes, made. Exactly. Now, uh, we don't have all the details because these numbers were released in such a way to, to ensure that plenty of outright theft could still happen. Like, seriously, only recipients who received over 150000 in loans were listed, and all we were given was a range. So given how much information was made public, if the administration straight up pocketed half of it, we wouldn't know about that yet. But even what we do know is plenty to raise eyebrows. Like, for example... We'll find out when we get Trump's tax returns. It'll be fine. Yeah, right, right. No, as soon as the audit's over. For example, so a couple of things to already piss you off. The number of businesses directly connected to members of goddamn Congress and the Trump administration that were approved for loans. Or the fact that, I shit you not, the Ayn Rand Institute got a six-figure <laughs> loan out of the deal. But the number that really leaps off the page at me mm, is the what? nearly $10 billion that went directly into the pockets of clergy. Okay, to be fair, America's biggest export is being wrong. No, we need to meet the supply. <laughs> right. Meat supply? Or what? You mean... Whatever, <laughs> just circling back for a second. Did you say the Ayn Rand yes. Institute accepted a government bailout? Applied really? for a government bailout, no less. Yes. Just, just weeping as they did it. No, <laughs> this is, this is, come on. You got to admit, this is a hard one. <sighs> oh, I bet it wasn't for them, though, because they never meant what they fucking said anyway. In all, according to estimates from American atheists, churches received between 6.2 and $9.7 billion dollars minimum right now we don't know because they only release rangers but keep in mind that any church that got one hundred and forty nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars or less isn't on the list in addition to that another 4.8 billion went to private schools predominantly christian ones and you know according to the fucking supreme court that's the same as a church when they want it to be so guarantee mm -hmm. you there's a bunch of those churches at 149.999 yeah guaranteed right yep. Yeah, exactly. So as American atheist president Nick Fish pointed out, quote, in two months, the Trump administration has given churches and religious schools more than double the CDC's annual budget, end quote. So, you know, when it comes to coronavirus mitigation, the most expensive ticket item right now might actually be thoughts and prayers. <laughs> yeah. And in 4th of July's news, as America celebrated Independence Day this past weekend, like a loveless married couple at a silent anniversary dinner in Olive Garden, <laughs> there was one who, down in Whoville, who no amount of jingoism or participation in grand falloonery could cheer. Okay. Christian hate group leader Tony Perkins. That was a great use of vocabulary, Eli. Thank you, Noah. I came up with those by myself. I hate I you so much. Them. What do those mean? What does grand flunery mean? <laughs> it's about a big yep. hat. Yes. Mm -hmm. So despite <laughs> the fact that Tony Perkizzle should have had fireworks dancing in his eyes with love for this great nation this year, it was, for him, a little bit sad. And that is, of course, because of gay people having rights. Yep. Here's what Tony had to say. Quote, last month, the court ruled in the case of Bostock versus Clayton County, Georgia, that the 1964 Civil Rights Act opposing discrimination based on the biological sex of an individual now must mean that 
discrimination based on homosexuality or transgender status necessarily entails discrimination based on sex. America has never been a perfect nation and never will be. If I have anything to say about it. <laughs> if I can change what all those words mean that I just tried to talk about. Yeah. But with all our problems, we have made tremendous progress in securing the God-given rights we too often take for granted. Wait, you don't have to secure shit you've already been given? What the <laughs> fuck are you talking about? Well, here, here it is, ready? But the exercise of those rights will be increasingly diminished and put in jeopardy if Congress refuses to safeguard them and instead allows the Supreme Court to rule however its justices prefer, regardless of the text of the Constitution and the law itself. She's, in other words, what good are rights without a little exclusivity? Am I right? <laughs> this is crazy. They've gone way too far. Like, who can we discriminate against now? Like, yes. who can we? Yep. Literally his point. So, yeah, I think we can all agree it was pretty difficult to feel patriotic about the holiday this year. But I take comfort in this, and I hope our listeners do, too. Any nation that makes Tony Perkins sad is getting better. <laughs> so, well, at least okay. parts of it. Silver lining. If he's sad, I guess I am happy. Like if there's <laughs> right? a little bit of Something happiness. Something to be happy about. Yeah, <laughs> it's good. And in statues of limitations news, Donald Trump took some time away from whatever it is he does there at the White House and <laughs> wrote up an executive order last week to address the very important statue gap. That deficit is really starting to widen between the U.S. and our rivals, especially now that accomplishments in the field of slavery are no longer being honored. <laughs> yeah, that was so a big one. Trump decided to fix that. He wants us to build a national garden of real American heroes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming G.I. Joe is there. <laughs> like, there's no way those action figures are not involved in the planning in oh, a weird yeah. little schematic on his desk somewhere. And now we have a group of people in the federal government paid with tax dollars figuring out the specs for a white nationalist spite garden <laughs> with Donald Trump. Oh. Okay, okay, I can get behind this. Uh, American heroes, Asa Akira, Riley Reed, Hammond yeah. Mehta. One of uh, the sure. many lists the three of them appear on together. Yeah. <laughs> what I'm trying surprised. to say is Hammett has a 14-inch penis. He doesn't brag about it, but everyone in the community he does. Tweet at him. Ask him. <laughs> <laughs> but don't tell him why. Don't do that. Please don't do that. He has to tell the truth. It's like being a cop. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he has to show you. So you might be thinking, this is vague and stupid, this whole idea. Uh, but don't worry, it's actually not that vague. Trump made a few suggestions, including Antonin Scalia <laughs> yes, uh <-huh. laughs> for the garden, a monument of Antonin Scalia's weird globular form. Not only was Scalia a Supreme Court justice who uh, voted in favor of Bible-inspired bigotry for pretty much his entire career whenever he got the chance to do that, he was also the recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And Trump wants a bunch of those medal winners in the spite garden. By the way, past winners include important national heroes like Rush Limbaugh yeah, right, and right. Dave Thomas of Wendy's really? and <laughs> Bill Cosby. Oh, Jesus Christ. Okay, hey, hey, Heath, let's not poo-poo the idea of building a statue to Dave Thomas. The man invented <laughs> the Baconator, okay? okay. <laughs> Fucking Baconator. Uh, Baconator came out in 2007. He died in 2002. Whatever, yeah. read a book. And uh, <laughs> one which, other... Which book? <laughs> the, I, my books, any of mine, discuss that. If They're you mostly Baconator. They're mostly about <laughs> burgers and the chronology, history. <laughs> And Presidential Medal of Freedom well, winners. Yeah, exactly. I take it seriously. Yeah. I mean, I have a monument. <laughs> and one other Presidential Medal of Freedom recipient that Trump specifically mentioned is Billy Graham. <laughs> In case anyone missed it, he's the guy who helped the Republican Party hijack evangelical Christianity in order to get rich people four decades of tax cuts, deregulation, and regressive wealth redistribution. That's what happened. Yeah, or if you'd prefer... Helped evangelical Christianity hijack the Republican Party in order to get Christian people government church subsidies 
and fucking legally protected bigotry. Hey, yeah, it was kind of a weird, creepy symbiosis of disgusting nature. Yeah. And in addition to being one of the most famous Christian leaders in recent history, I guess I should say in tandem with being a Christian leader like that, he was a giant <laughs> bigot. Too. Yeah. Turns out he was super close friends with Richard Nixon and got recorded on the Nixon tapes. That includes the time they were hanging out in the Oval Office, coming up with new slur words for Jewish people for several hours, talking about the stranglehold the Jewish people have on the media. Trump wants that guy to have a monument. Mm -hmm. I, I get it. It's something for the next generation of Antifa to tip over. <laughs> <laughs> huh? And in rats foiled again news tonight. If your rat's dick is too small, there's nothing science can do for you. I hate this and show. We learned that, <laughs> and we learned really? that a couple of weeks ago when the International Journal of Impotence Research retracted a 2013 paper that claimed to have discovered a compound that could increase both sexual behavior and penis size in rats for promoting homeopathy. The paper, not the rat penises. When asked why they didn't act on this sooner, they reminded us that impotence is their whole thing. Really? God, is there anything more demeaning than having to retract something as the journal of impotence? Just, <laughs> All right, everyone. Come on, guys. Who's laughing? <laughs> this is serious. We did science. Yeah. So <laughs> Give me back my cards. <laughs> got to soft pedal that study. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, this isn't really a scathing atheist story, but it's about rat dicks. So I decided to run with it anyway. It begins in 2013 when a group of researchers submitted a paper claiming that a compound called Impasa was effective in treating erectile dysfunction in rats. And while the paper identified Impasa as, quote, a compound stimulating endothelial nitric acid synthase, end quote, there were clues that it was actually a homeopathic remedy, such as the part of the methods section where they just come out and say that, quote, produced according to homeopathic technology. End quote. It just says the word? Yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> and the technology in question being dilute to non-existence and then shake a magical number of times. <laughs> okay. Does the Journal of Impotence not have a a keyboard with control F on it? Yeah. Just check for homeopathy. <laughs> and I don't know, Andrew Wakefield and O Jews. Like that's gonna weed out <laughs> a bunch of bad stuff with like almost no effort. <laughs> I mean they have it now, Heath. Yeah, right. <laughs> And finally tonight, in ham cell culture news. Oh, Jesus. Hamsel. Yeah. Hams. Mm -hmm. Ham Move what? over, Steve Shives. Step oh, back. Cancel. Anita Sarkeesian. There's a new SJW in town. Amish Wolverine and landlocked boat owner Ken Ham, who this week called on cancel culture to cancel Charles Darwin. What? <laughs> to cancel Darwin? And like. Yep. Stop going to his comedy show. Yeah, right. Like, so, what's, about? what's next? Ken Ham's going to take a hit out on him? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's not super clear if Ken Ham knows what cancel culture is. Uh, I'm going to guess clear. No. He doesn't. <laughs> he seems to think it goes something, something people are upset. Mm -hmm. Something, something I don't have to hear about the person everyone is mad at anymore. <laughs> cancel culture. End of cancel culture. That's the whole thing. Yeah. He's just like, okay, unsubscribe from evolution. Canceled. What? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So with that in mind, Ham took to his show Answers News this week. Pretty ironic name. To call for the canceling of Darwin with his co-host Avery Foley pointing out that, quote, people are all upset about these Confederate statues and things like that. But what about Charles Darwin? Because he was extremely racist and yet he celebrated He's taught in public schools across the nation, in colleges across the nation. At which point, the other co-host, Bodie Hoges, yells, and I do mean yells, and the textbooks! <laughs> <laughs> and then Avery continues, and yet, he was horribly racist. So why are we not upset about Darwin and wanting to cancel him? Jeez, okay, so like, th that assertion is problematic, but regardless, like, there's a big difference between putting up a memorial to a person that was racist and putting up a memorial to racism, right? To a person whose accomplishment was racist. 
Ham is smart enough to know the difference, but he's also smart enough to know that the people who are listening to him are not. Yeah. So back to Ken Ham, who concluded his little rant on the radio program by saying, quote, they won't touch Darwin because he is like a god to them. Why? Well, his ideas give people a supposed justification to reject God and do whatever they want with sex, determine right and wrong for themselves, have an abortion, and so on. <laughs> Ultimately, it's a spiritual issue, end quote. <laughs> wow, look at these finch beaks. All right, let's have some butt sex and then abort the baby. <laughs> yes, <laughs> what do you think? Dude, yours is a forgiveness-based theology, Ken. We can abort ass babies all we want and live in paradise everlasting in your worldview, provided we don't die while aborting the ass baby. Yeah. Well, as long as we're able to talk while we're dying, while we're aborting the ass well, baby. Well, yeah, exactly. We get, We'd get have a, to die instantly. Oh, yeah. I love Jesus. You can sneak it in there, right? Yeah. Exactly. Right. So I think we all learned something pretty important today, which is that Confederate generals need to give everyone permission to be gay and have abortions. <laughs> Not sure how we do that because they're dead, but, you know, maybe we could do a, a deep fake of Yule Cecius Grant or, you know, <laughs> we can make this work out for everybody is what I'm saying. We can... All right. Well, while I unfollow Darwin's Twitter account in accordance with Ken Ham's wishes, we're going to close out the headlines for the night. Heath, Eli, thanks as always. You'll slice us. You'll see. You'll <laughs> listen. <laughs> and we'll come Ulysses. <laughs> Tom and Caesar will be here to get the three of us in the mood to insult people. Ah, 2019. A year when nobody could imagine a person ever unironically saying, ah, 2019. <laughs> but there are still glimmers of light, even in a timeline as dark as ours, like being reminded what awesome people listen to this show. As full of racists and idiots as the world is, it's comforting to know that it's still also filled with people who donate over $200,000 to charity just to hear us make fun of their uncle. And joining us to <laughs> insult a few uncles are two men made for that kind of job. Tom and Cecil from Cognitive Dissonance and Citation Needed. Guys, welcome back. I, I don't have anything really roasty to say. I'm just happy to hang out with you and Heath. It's nice. Oh, oh <laughs> Eli's, you. Eli's back Cecil. from uh, paternity leave, Cecil. I know he is. I know. <laughs> oh, well, all right. All right. Okay. Um, right. Statement stands. <laughs> so for our second roast of Don't the do evening. Don't Cecil. Uh, <laughs> not in front of the six-month-old charity roast. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, Cecil, since you're all warmed up, we'll turn right to you. Uh, Dan would like a rough roast for Jeff Bezos. He's like the Mr. Furley of billionaires. He always has his <laughs> Amazon Alexa pressed up against your wall so he could burst into your Facebook feed just totally unannounced. You know? <laughs> Bezos has fucked more moms and pops than a summer of love pansexual. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, Heath, this is a great one here. Vexel would like you to roast obnoxious customers. Fan-fucking-tastic topic. <laughs> Good job, Vexel. <laughs> Great job. So I was a bartender for many years, so I'm going to take the angle of that type of customer. Hey, obnoxious customer. And by that, I mean customer. <laughs> Welcome to the bar. Let me give you a quick FAQ to help you out. Question one, you're going to ask these questions and I'm going to answer them for you. Question one, do you have, and I'm going to stop you right there. Here's the menu. <laughs> this menu it's kind of like a list of things we have. <laughs> so we don't need to go through question one. This is the answer for you. It's written down. We have it ready. Question two from you. Does this come with... Hop! Going to stop you again. Ibid. It comes <laughs> with what it fucking says on the menu. And question three. Would you be able to... No. No. <laughs> you would not be able to. Here's how this works. You name things from this fucking list and I get them for you. That's what we'd be able to do. Also, you should probably leave now because you're definitely getting some items that are, quote, off menu at this point. Based on this yeah, and four and four. I have never actually looked in the back for anything. You hear me? <laughs> I, just, I just stand there until I feel like you're done being pissed. And tip better. Everybody tip better assholes. All right, Noah, this one's for you. Lucas would like a roast of his fiance Sydney. 
Uh, though, honestly, they are probably married by now. Mm. They could be married, divorced, and dead by now, too. <laughs> True. <laughs> oh, wow. True. Yeah, the note even says, we're young as fuck. And I'm like, well, when you wrote that, Lucas. I mean, not- <laughs> so, yeah, Sydney. Oh, uh, Sydney. 2019. Yes. Sydney looks like the stuff that the eurythmic sour dreams are made of. It's just, it's just like, it looks like her eyes are trying to distance themselves from something that her mouth said and her nose is negotiating a settlement. It's kind of a weird. <laughs> thing. Actually, I, 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 I feel like such an asshole. You're, you're, you're lovely, Sydney. I didn't mean it. And Eli, Holly would like a roast of HR departments. I gave you guys such easy ones and took such a hard one for myself. Are we allowed to take you back did. roasts at the end like that, though? Are we playing with that? <laughs> ah, HR departments. The last line of defense against sexual harassment and racism in the workplace. Except they don't do any of that. No, they just <laughs> yell at you for not signing Carol's birthday card. Yep. And then... <laughs> Pretend Devon's name is hard to pronounce. HR departments. They're like the CDC in 2020. In theory, that's it. Just in theory, that's what it's about. All right. And uh, Tom, I've got one for you here from a Tom who would like you to roast him. You know, I, I usually hate having to do a roast based only on a picture because I, I can't usually figure out what to say. But holy fuck, Tom, I get it, man. <laughs> that picture? Well, that picture's a thousand words. They're all adjectives, and none can be used within a thousand yards of a school. <laughs> Again, I'm usually like a little bit eh, on the self-roast time, but this time, this makes sense. I cannot imagine waking up in that soft, shitty excuse for a body and thinking, oh, maybe I should pick someone else to make fun of. I can't actually imagine waking up in that body at all though because the only way i'd go to sleep built like that is if that sleep were mercifully final oh, God. And I, <laughs> I know i'm spending a lot of time here on that thing that you pilot unhappily through the world but that's not because your face is some great joy to behold it's just because every time i try to look at you my eyes start watering i feel like i can somehow smell you through the picture is that a thing because you look like the idea of bad hygiene somehow got itself a driver's license. <laughs> also, man, fuck you. Stop using my name. You're using it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Heath, that last one was great for you. This next one is perfect for you, both because it's a big fancy word and because of what it means. Mary would like you to roast a matto normativity. Fantastic. Yeah, this word, <laughs> this word's amazing. It means... The obnoxious societal pressure to desire monogamy, romance, and or marriage. And it's coined by Arizona State philosophy professor Elizabeth Brake, who I now want to marry. But (laughs) not really. Because you know what I'm doing right after this? Whatever the fuck I want. Literally anything (laughs) I want. As long as it's alone. (laughs) Everyone who bought into the marriage thing, they're either secretly or openly furious about that so they're all selling that tulip they bought at the end of the mania but it's not even their tulip itself they're selling the concept of buying a tulip in a mania hoping to water down the mistake with bigger numbers and getting me in that number just be happy that my people are subsidizing your regret with more taxes it's bullshit but we're doing it be happy i'm gonna go I don't know, satisfy all my whims without asking anyone's permission and just doing whatever I want. Enjoy the opposite of that, everybody else. All right, I'll enjoy all right. human contact. We've learned cool. a lot of yeah. things, mostly that Heath doesn't want to get his dick sucked after this. That's interesting. <laughs> and my oh. point just got proven. There it is. Sell that tulip. Sell that tulip. <laughs> I don't think you got the point of that at all. <laughs> oh, I don't think you did. Go ahead. <laughs> maybe, maybe if you can fuck the tulip, I don't know. <laughs> You're the one with the tulip. All he right. can fuck a tulip if he wants to. That's I don't have to ask anyone go, about that. I'll go buy a tulip. I'll fuck it. No one can say me nay. <laughs> all right. So, Eli, as our current baby expert, I guess, by Speaking default. Speaking of bad decisions. <laughs> <laughs> Ronald uh, would like you to roast his 19-month-old son, Rory, though, as Tom said, Rory could now be old enough to marry Lucas, who the hell knows? Yeah. Well, Rory is the most jacked baby I have ever seen. (laughs) 
Ronald, are you sure DMX isn't your mailman? Like, did you go to a concert? Or your kid has a 12 pack, dude. I hate to break it to you, but that discount formula you got such a great deal on, that's muscle milk, man. Stop, <laughs> Stop doing that. Also, please don't send your crazy, crazy muscular baby to beat me up because he absolutely looks like he could do it. <laughs> All right, Cecil. Quentin would like a roast for his friend Jim. He looks like if one of the Marx Brothers was Luigi. <laughs> <laughs> he looks like he would have an iPad clip on his belt. And then he like unclips it and checks his voicemail on speaker on an iPad. In front of him. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. <sighs> All right. So, Tom, how about a little uh, sass for daylight saving time for, uh, oh, for Christine? Fucking thank you. Hey, you know what you can fool? By changing a name? No one. Nothing. Time doesn't change just because you use a different number when you stagger out the fucking door in the morning. All Daylight Savings Time does is remind you every fucking year as it gets harder and harder to adjust to a temporary, stupid, meaningless rule that robs you of one more hour of precious sleep that you're old and your body hurts and it's morning and it's going to be morning for hours and there's nothing you can do but grit your teeth and see that every stupid, cheerful asshole who springs out of bed gleefully laughing at those of us who would sell your children without a second thought into a cobalt mine for 15 minutes more of blessed unconscious. <laughs> Jesus. All right, well done. Next up, we got a round of special requests. First up, we have one for Heath. Emily would like a roast for her sister, Charlotte. Okay. Well, first of all, nobody's fooled by your alias. You're not the Bronte sisters. Fucking relax. <laughs> <laughs> also, based on the picture we got, Charlotte is looking approximately Bronte on the melanoma scale. So there's that. <laughs> Charlotte looks like she's in a Karen detox program. Like she was clearly becoming Karen and she knew it. And then she moved to the Florida Keys to find herself because she read a little Hemingway. But she found Karen and then became a white lady in middle America. That's what happened. And Eli, uh, Charles would like a roast for celebrity mime Brian Randone. What? Charles. Charles. Thank you for this fucking crazy dark universe citation needed essay. I know I'm supposed to make a joke. Hey, it looks like this. Let me explain. The journey to this roast began, began by me watching Brian Randone's shitty crucifixion based mime show. <laughs> which, what? Which he talks during. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> Set up my he room. mimes all the stations <laughs> of the cross. But then there's some where he's like, ah, oh, fuck, he just talks to a guy here. Hey, Thomas, thanks for the lift. <laughs> and that research journey, that research journey ended with his murder trial for what? killing his girlfriend. What? It's, it's hard to roast someone when 48 hours already did such a fantastic <laughs> job. But, but I will say this. I will say this about Brian Randone. His stations of the cross way more convincing than his testimony in court. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Cecil, why don't you take Erica's ex-coworker? She looks like she's about to ask you why you're stenciling Black Lives Matter on your own house. And then <laughs> when you explain that you can do whatever you want to your own house, she asks to speak to the manager of the house. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and to uh, round out these special requests, Tom, we have one for you. Demond Blow would like a roast for their ex-wife, Rachel. Oh, God. I, I know people like Rachel. Rachel is the kind of person who makes everything about her, not because she is selfish or myopic, but because so long as everything is about her, she thinks she's in control. And the, the thing is, this works. She is in control when every person and every action is evaluated, not just by her, but eventually by everyone afraid of her shit and exclusively through her lens, her experience, her reaction. She is fully in charge. That is fucking why she does it. But this is also why Rachel will always, and I mean this always, ultimately be alone because Rachel's whole manipulation is based on the empathy of others and no well is bottomless. 
and Rachel will burn through everyone that ever enters her orbit. And that burn and churn will happen faster and faster as people in her life become more mature and more aware until inevitably Rachel is left drunkenly thumbing through old pictures, tracing a single lonely finger across the smiling faces of those people she never knew how to love and who can no longer remember her face. There should always be thunder at the end of your roast. Okay. <laughs> well, smited. All right. It's time for another spiteing round. The category is famous fucks. So for this spiteing round, I want you to tell me what these people should be famous for. <laughs> uh, big thanks to Daniel, Barbara, Phil, and Cody. Uh, so we're going to start with Noel Fielding. Ah, yes. No fielding of the Great British Bake Off, the big fat quiz of the year, and of course, the Mighty Boosh. All great reasons to be famous. However, he should be famous for surviving a motorcycle crash using nothing but his hair. So, <laughs> All right. And Heath, what should Mark Zuckerberg be famous for? Oh, he should be famous for building a device for Cambridge Analytica to get <laughs> Donald Trump elected. <laughs> All right, Cecil, I got a great one for you. What should Jenny McCarthy be famous for? She should get the first honorary degree from Google University. It comes, <laughs> comes with a stole made from anti-vaxxer teeth, too. It oh, really nice, nice. Accessorizes awesome. nicely. All right, speaking of the devil, Tom, what should Lucian Graves of the Satanic Temple be famous for? Okay, a uh, guy with the least evil, most evil eye. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's because his eye is fucked up. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yes. And Noah, you're up next. This one comes from Jay. Tell us why Mr. Rogers should really be famous. Oh, uh, that's easy. For being the 20th century's admirable Christian. Yeah, they got one. <laughs> that was yeah, that's it. That's true. All right. Well done all around. A new round, same category, except this time, I want you to tell me why this famous fucker refuses to wear a mask. Thanks to Kyle, Martin, Tim, and Donnie. And we're going to start with an easy one. Cecil. Why won't Dave Ramsey wear a mask? Well, people call him up for financial advice and he responds like a Comcast rep. Have you tried turning your paychecks on and off? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess he isn't wearing a mask because he can't be gazelle intense without deep breaths. I don't know. Oh, right, right. <laughs> All right. And Eli, why won't Rush Limbaugh wear a mask? Rush Limbaugh won't wear a mask because he has breathing problems due to lung cancer. Yeah. <laughs> That is true. I <laughs> I know I know that's not really a joke oh, or a such roast. A good joke. I just want everyone oh, to remember the good news that Rush Limbaugh has lung cancer <laughs> and he can't breathe very well, <laughs> and so it, that mean. will get worse until he dies. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks for bringing that's up so the mood a little bit. That's great. Thanks. Wow. Um, all right, Heath. Uh, <laughs> you. Eli may have stole your answer. Uh, how about Robert Kraft? <laughs> oh, well, if if Robert Kraft wears a mask, his happy ending masseuse can't spit his cum back into his mouth as usually. <laughs> so it's tricky. Like, no judgment. That's just like a genuine logistical problem for him and her or him. I don't know. Oh, man. And Eli, why won't Chris Pratt wear a mask? Ooh, uh, because his pastor told him it would kill the vibe at youth group. Yeah. Oh, also, if he wore a mask, people might not recognize him as that guy who was okay, kinda in the thing they liked. <laughs> <laughs> All right, got one for you, Noah. Why won't Pete Rose wear a mask? Oh, uh, that's easy. So that people who walk by him at the mall where he's been signing autographs every day from the same chair for the last third of a century won't forget to pity him. <laughs> oh, I know where that mall is. That <laughs> it's in Vegas. I, I have another one for you here, Cecil. Why won't Elon Musk wear a mask? Well, look, you can't prove to everyone how you're a down to earth billionaire and smoke a blunt with Joey Rogues with a mask on. I mean, come on. This billionaire is so down to earth, he started his own space program, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Just like right, you I wanna, are. I push back a little bit on the idea that you can't smoke a blunt with a mask on, but um, <laughs> you probably shouldn't. You probably shouldn't. Oh, okay, oh, yeah. in the interest of science, I'll believe you. All right. They so, should have lit that blunt with one of his flamethrowers that he invented because oh, he's down yeah. to earth. Yep. <laughs> I don't know how they missed that. <laughs> All right, and uh, for our final spiting round entry, Tom, why won't J.J. Abrams wear oh. a mask? J. 
J.J. Abrams won't wear a mask because after Lost, it's clear that he has no problem infecting America and then choke-fucking us <laughs> with our own dreams. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well done, gentlemen. Back to the thick of it. Uh, this first one is a two for Tiffany gave us $200 to roast her 10-year-old daughter and anti-vaxxers. So have at it. All right. Well, I'll, you know, your 10 year old daughter looks like she's a 35 year old unemployed artist. I mean, <laughs> sorry, that's redundant. She looks like a 35 year old artist. So, she looks like Hermione lost the bet and had to wear Harry's glasses for a day and, and also pretend she was 40 in between careers. That's. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll take anti-vaxxers. A uh, fuck anti-vaxxers. Every single Karen in the bunch fucking side parts her hair and has a big yelly sob at the local town hall meeting and then goes home and Googles herself into killing her baby. Anti-vaxxers <laughs> aren't just what? bad people. They're bad for humanity in general. Yep. All right, Heath, I got a good one for you. Travis would like you to roast him as he recovers from cancer. Okay. He included a photo of himself <laughs> on remission day. Great. All right. Well, first of all, Travis, all cells matter. You're big, <laughs> <funny asshole. laughs> and I know you're acutely aware of that because you look like a juggalo went through a car wash. <laughs> but congrats on the remission. Uh, yeah, I'm sure the chemo got rid of every single cancer <laughs> cell. <laughs> they are all gone. There's no chance of any of those oh, still being shit. alive. You don't have to worry. Oh, no. Boy, I'd be way more confident that that was funny if we had done this one more promptly. <laughs> <laughs> Do a little Facebook there. Okay, no, I've got one for you. Hillary gave us 50 bucks for you to roast her ex-coworker, Diane, have at it. Oh, Diane is so fucking horrible. All right, first of all, if Diane ever starts repeating two weeks, be on your toes. Her head is going to explode when Arnie throws it at you. Seriously, she looks like Dorothy somehow got pregnant by the scarecrow and the cowardly lion. She looks like the fucking thing that appears behind you if you say that bitch Carol Baskin into a mirror three times. But going after a horrible person like hers looks misses the point because first and foremost, she's a terrible human being that doesn't deserve a single pop culture reference let alone three generations worth <laughs> all right so tom i got a challenge for you okay sean would like a roast of blizzard's ceo okay <laughs> yeah fuck you jl and brack looks like putting on a suit without a shower <laughs> you know he looks the way introvert smells is what i mean like <laughs> I'm not surprised he was on the wrong side of history supporting China over Hong Kong. This guy looks like all he's ever wanted in the whole world is for some powerful force to dominate him. So <laughs> no wonder he doesn't understand. And look, Brack, if that's your thing, have at it, be had at, whatever. I don't care. <laughs> but you might have to poke your head out from behind a screen full of imaginary conflicts you can solve with an electronic vorpal sword once in a while to see what real courage looks like and try, just fucking try what it might take to have some goddamn guts. Also, fuck you, Eli, for making me look this up. Yay! <laughs> That's in your brain forever. No, Ugh. Tom knows video game stuff. All right. Tom loves Hearthstone. <laughs> I, still, I don't know what Hearthstone is. I didn't look that part. Oh, he knows. All right. Knows. So let's wrap Man. up this segment with a batch of big money <laughs> donations. These folks went all in to do some good last November, and they have been eagerly awaiting for the pile on these subjects deserve. So everybody feel free to have Adam. First up, an anonymous donor gave us $500 to roast air officers who use the suicide awareness stand down day to do shitty things. I don't know what that means. Holy shit. These assholes are dangerous. So these are like officers who instead of talking about like suicide and awareness, they get like fucking cold pizza and PowerPoints and did forced calisthenics on the one day a year. They were supposed to talk about suicide to the armed forces. Like, what's the matter? You couldn't skip over seatbelt day in the jet fighters? <laughs> this is your revenge? Uh, look, I know whoever these fuckers are, they need to lie and tell themselves that the boner they got during Top Gun was just about watching Goose die. But it's getting <laughs> dangerous, people. It's dangerous. <laughs> All right, Noah, you're up next. And this one is a challenge. Sawyer and Mindy want to roast their dog, Stella, but they'd like it from the perspective of their cat, Izzy. Yeah, what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> what am I supposed to <laughs> lick my what? asshole after I say this? I was going to yeah. do that anyway. 
Um, all right, so maybe I do a bitchy cat voice. I don't know. But I'm sure if Izzy could roast Stell, she'd say something like, first of all, Shiba Inu is just fucking pretentious corgi. We all know that. And secondly, that's not what eating pussy means, you dumb fuck. <laughs> you know that thing they do with you and the peanut butter? That's way closer. Also, and I don't know how much more clearly I can explain this shit, it's attached to your ass. <laughs> it doesn't matter how fast you run, it will retreat just as quickly, <laughs> you fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Jay Lynn would like a roast for their friend Stephen Cecil. Have at it. Well, he's wearing a witch hat. What kind of magician would you be? Let's see. An illusionist? Because your beard looks like the fucking Aleutian Islands. Like a six of badly placed stepping stones from your mouth to your ear. If it were like a Flores lava course, there would be some pretty tough jumps there. It's like it's like you took a razor and you randomly cut off part of it to send the rest of your beard a message. <laughs> Yeah, based on Jen's letter, Steven's like a great guy. That said, Steven, you do look like an extra who Jason Statham punches at the beginning of a heist movie. So. <laughs> you look like a pirate whose buried treasure is an anime body pillow. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Heath, I got one for you. Alice would like a roast of transphobes. Oh, lovely. Okay, transphobes, bring it in. You're not allowed to listen to our show. Get the yeah, fuck out. Right? <laughs> you can listen to the rest of this roast and then go fucking die. And just be aware that two of the big intellectual influences in your hate group are the most overrated author in history and the most overrated podcaster in history. Plus, a bunch of hacky stand-up comedians who are, right now, masturbating into a pile of bed bugs at Motel 6, <laughs> getting ready for their big 10 minutes in fucking overbite Missouri's laugh track. <laughs> Fuck you. Yeah. Fun fact, all transphobes smell like fear and gun oil. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. Excellent. Okay, I got a double one here for Eli and Tom. John would like you to roast cosmic dread and existential nihilism, respectively. Fuck Cosmic Dread. Oh, the universe is so big and scary. Who the fuck cares? It's not coming to your house to give you a wedgie. What <laughs> lies beyond the stars? Who gives a fuck? You know what it is? It's all me. That's right. Everywhere in the gaping maw of space and time that fills you with dread, it turns out the universe has replicated me eight billion, <laughs> billion, billion times over. And it's just me reading Harry Potter back and forth, trying on smaller and smaller thongs. Oh, now Christ. you have something to be terrified in yeah. the vacuum of space. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. yeah. Ah. Existential nihilism is probably right, but it's also lazy and useless. Great. Good job. You figured out that you probably don't matter over much. Wow, you're not 12 anymore. Congratulations, deep thought. But if that's your whole fucking jam, some epiphany that you use to justify inaction, inattention, and an ennui-filled shrug and a sigh, then you don't understand the ultimate purpose of any pursuit of truth is not to pontificate about your grand ideas and convince second-year undergrads to sleep with you, but to live a full and meaning-filled <laughs> life. Absent action, absent movement, absent a desire to use what you know to be better every day, your deep thoughts only skim the surface. Your philosophy is actionless. It's veneer all the way down. Scratch the surface. You just get more surface. And that makes you the very worst thing that you can be while squandering the one life you get to fuck up. It makes you fucking boring. Amen. <laughs> I like that you specified it's sophomore undergrads. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, next up, we have a request for Heath. John would like a roast of his wife, Kim. Okay. Kim. Hi, John and Kim, by the way. We met in New York. Great time. So Kim is a living, breathing problem of evil. It's amazing. And when I say living and breathing, I mean just fucking barely. Despite Kim being a very active adopter of rescue animals and literally working as a neuroscientist at a children's hospital. Here's what happened in her life over the past year. Her brother died at age 27. She got into a car crash that almost killed her. And she got thyroid cancer that needed aggressive surgery. Twice. Jesus. That happened twice. And then she had to live in 2020. Yeah. Kim, what the fuck are you hiding? <laughs> I know you're like, say nothing. And we'll assume you're in a fuck dungeon with Hillary Clinton and some kids. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Wink. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> All 
All right. I also have a double here. Alan donated 350 bucks for a roast of his wife and sister. Well, Aaron, his wife, is awesome. I mean, she's a super mom. She's cool. She's making the world a better place. But come on, Aaron. Terrible taste in men. I mean, really? Aaron, the first guy who ate your ass from the back at a Grateful Dead concert? <laughs> <laughs> he looks like... I mean, he looks like a guy who ate your ass from the back at a Grateful Dead concert. <laughs> and... By the way, Does I just want to be matter? super <laughs> clear because I don't want her to get mad at Alan. Alan did not tell us that he ate your ass from the back of that Grateful Dead concert <laughs> where you met. But you know it. I know it. And more importantly, Aaron, your children know it. They will never, ever ask you the story of how you met because they know deep, deep in their heart. One or both of you will have to utter the phrase, but then I had to pause to throw up. So that's on you, Aaron. That's on you. So there was like a multiple roast here because he's asking, I would like you to roast all their husbands, me, my good friend, Randy, and my sister's husband, Dan. So I'm going to do those. There's no way that those aren't all the same guy. I'm a white guy with a beard that gets confused with every other white guy with a beard. So I actually think I'm one of these guys. Or, or maybe I'm all three of these guys. <laughs> And I just want to say that you all look like White Sox and Bears fans complaining to the beer vendor that they have to give you your change in hot dogs, oiling <laughs> your beards down with Jardinera and saying, there's always next year when you're talking about your team and your cholesterol. <laughs> Jardinera is actually a really good beard oil. <laughs> <laughs> smells good, too. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, Tom, I, I feel like this one's right up your alley and a great one to close. How about a roast for Carol's dad, Rob? All right. Well, I'm sorry, Carol, but your dad, Rob, got a severe case of fuck you. I got mine. Uh, this happens to some guys as they get older. You see, your dad's wealthy now. And instead of doing the right thing and realizing that the wealth he built was created by working within a system designed, rigged and maintained by and for guys exactly like him and being fucking grateful for the lucky happenstance of the good fortune that created the preconditions for his success. He has come to believe instead that he deserves it. He's like a fish who ate all the other fish in the aquarium, laying claim to the burping treasure chest in the center as if he earned that, unable to see that the whole fucking ecosystem exists for him. He literally is a guy who cannot see his filter. Your dad, Rob, is protective because having built success, he knows that it's tenuous, that the foundations of wealth and privilege are weak because they're illusory. Rob has cast aside his values because he's afraid of losing his good fortune, knowing it's unlikely to be recreated. He knows, like we all do, that success is more luck than brains or brawn, and he is deeply afraid that he won't be so lucky the next go around. And he's right, because Carol, as you pointed out, he's in his 70s now, which means his time is over. He is the walking dead with a debit card, and in the age of COVID, <laughs> you are one trip to Costco away from inheriting everything. <laughs> Hey, you know, with a little luck, we are a little late to this roast. You know, <laughs> uh, all right, here's hoping that's still funny, too. All right. So while Tom's words are still <laughs> echoing in Rob's hollow existence, we're going to close off for the night. But there are still more insults to come. So if you haven't gotten to yours yet, stay tuned here and over on Cogdis. Thanks for your patience. Tom, Cecil, appreciate your help as always. Our Thanks, pleasure. guys. Thanks for having us. Before we put our masks back on, I want to let you know that I'm going to be taking part in an online protest on Saturday. Or I, I, I don't know. It sounds weird to call it that. But the tri-state freethinkers have protested Canham's Ark Park every year since it opened. And apparently no pandemic is going to stop them. The format has changed, obviously, but that just means more people can show up. I'm going to be giving a talk along with a bunch of other prominent secular activists, including Mantisa Thomas, Aaron Rock, a bunch of others. So if you're looking for something to do on Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern time, keep an eye on at PIAT pod on Twitter for links to the event or check the show notes for this episode. Anyway, that's all the blast movie we've got for you tonight. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show's Hot Friend God Awful Movies debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Tuesday, and an even newer episode of our half-sister show Citation Needed debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, I'd be putting the Owen show if I neglected to thank Heath Enright for his wordcraft, Eli Bosnick for his stagecraft, Cecil for his tradecraft, and Tom for his love crafty and insults. I also want to thank Lucinda for trying to make it this week. Just keep in mind she's got an immunocompromised dad to take care of through a pandemic, and that's hard enough when they fucking cooperate. 
ornery motherfucker. Anyway, she'll be back soon. Also need to thank Lisa, Ann, and Don for providing this week's Farnsworth quote. Incidentally, if you need more Shakespeare than you're getting right now, you'll find a link to the Bardcast on the show notes for this episode. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's best bipeds, Adam, Mark, Greg, Jonathan, and Glorious Baxter, Stephen, Christine, Peter, Kurt, David, George, and Yorkie. Adam, Mark, Greg, and Jonathan, whose dicks are so long that most of them can still do social distancing even during a blowjob. Baxter, Stephen, Christine, and Peter, whose IQs are higher than Arizona's infection count. And Kurt, David, George, and Yorkie who have taken more people's breath away than COVID-19. Together, this dozen delightful disbelievers dishearten the dappifers of deistic dribble this week by donating dollars. Not everybody has the dollars it takes to donate some to us, but if you do, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash scathingatheist, whereby you'll earn early access to an extended ad-free version of every episode, or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. The legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of B. Andrew Torres, Tim Robinson handles our social media, and our audio engineer is Morgan Clark, who also wrote all the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingatheist.com. Rat dicks. <laughs> the preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2020. All rights reserved.